Hi, and welcome back to part two of our double podcast episode about the life and work of Howard Zinn. If you haven't listened to part one yet, I'd go back and listen to that first. A la mattina, appena alzata, oh bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, 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 a la mattina. Where we left off last time, Howard Zinn had got a new job at Boston University and had begun getting actively involved in the movement against the Vietnam War. I do a lot of speaking, writing, wrote an article for the nation called Vietnam, The Logic of Withdrawal. And uh, Beacon Press, which had published my book on SNCC, um, suggested I write a book by that name, Vietnam, The Logic of Withdrawal. Because there was no book... A fair amount had been written about the Vietnam War uh, by 1967, um, but no book called for immediate withdrawal from Vietnam. That was considered too radical. People talked about, oh, we can't withdraw precipitously. I love that word, (laughs) precipitously. Even after you've been at war for seven years, if you can leave, they say, oh, we mustn't be precipitous. <laughs> so that's what they say now about the war in Iraq, right? We, uh, we, we you know, we've, we're, we've been there, yeah, six years. No, we must, uh, mustn't be precipitous. Afghanistan, we've been there eight years, nine years. No. So, yeah, I, so I wrote this book, Vietnam, The Logical Withdrawal, and uh, I had... Just before writing the book, I'd been to Japan. I'd been on a, invited by a Japanese anti-war group called Beheran, Japanese anti-war group, invited to do a lecture tour of Japan about the war, sort of representing the peace, the anti-war movement in the United States. And, um, and they invited me and they invited a, a young black guy named Ralph Featherstone, who had, I had worked with in SNCC in the South. The two of us did this lecture tour to 13 Japanese cities in 13 days, <laughs> from Hokkaido in the north down to Okinawa uh, in the South, all the way through Japan, uh, every night a different city. And uh, it was, that, was a, that was a great experience. The Japanese were far more against the Vietnam War than the United States. I mean, interesting when you think of it, oh, Vietnam, communism and Vietnam, a threat. Well, yeah, Japan is much closer. <laughs> if anybody might be threatened, oh, Japan, you know, but no, that, the Japanese didn't see communism as a threat. And they saw the war for what it was, an attempt to extend American power in Asia. So, yeah, so I'd been to Japan, and so I wrote this book, Vietnam Logical Withdrawal, which immediately went into like seven printings and and uh, was distributed at anti-war rallies and uh, and was taken up and, you know, was, got a fair amount of publicity. One thing, I, I, the last chapter of the book was a speech I wrote for Lyndon Johnson. Of course, he didn't ask for it. <laughs> but, you know... Uh, that wasn't going to stop me. I'm going to write a speech for it. And the idea of the speech was because everybody said, well, it, it, we, don't, we shouldn't be in Vietnam, but how can we get out? Just what you hear now about Iraq and Afghanistan. Well, we shouldn't be there, but surely we can't just leave. No. And, uh, you know, it's uh, as if somebody had broken into your house and, <laughs> and you said, get out. Said, well, I, I can't just leave. (laughs) Uh, And uh, so I wrote the speech for Lyndon Johnson, in which he he explains to the American people why he is ordering our troops to leave. Very convincingly. Convinced me. (laughs) But apparently uh, convinced other people. And and there were they reprinted this speech you know, in newspapers, and uh, there was a businessman in Ohio who who distributed copies of my book to every member of Congress, and 
and president and vice president, of course. It didn't stop the war, but... Uh, so I was writing, writing, speaking, and that's what my life consisted of. And, and in early 1968, uh, the North Vietnamese invited uh, what they described as a, a responsible member of the American peace movement to come to Hanoi and to pick up three American prisoners of war, flyers, uh, who would be the first ones released by the North Vietnamese. It was January of 68, it was the time of the Tet holiday, also the time of the Tet offensive in Vietnam. But in honor of the holiday, they wanted to make a goodwill gesture, they said, and they would release three prisoners if some responsible member of the American Peace Movement would come. And so I was considered a responsible member of the American Peace Movement and Daniel Berrigan uh, also. So two responsible members, that's better. And uh, I had never met Dan Berrigan, but I met him. I met him on the morning that we were going to take the flight to Hanoi together. Uh, met him in an apartment in Greenwich Village where we'd been briefed by David Dellinger and Tom Hayden, both of whom had been to Vietnam, to, to North Vietnam. And so, yeah, so Dan Bergen and I flew or halfway around the world to Hanoi, stopping in six different cities and on the way. and. Uh, and uh, spent a week in Laos because the plane that was supposed to take us from Vientiane in Laos to Hanoi um, had not arrived because it had, was supposed to take off from Saigon. There was a certain special plane, ICC, International Control Commission plane, set up by the Geneva Accords, and, and that plane f flew six times a month to Hanoi. <laughs> that, that's how regular schedule was, six times a month. Well, it was dangerous to fly to Hanoi. Um, and uh, it flew from Saigon to Nam Penh in Cambodia to Vientiane in Laos to Hanoi. And it didn't arrive when it was supposed to arrive in Vientiane where we were going to take it to Hanoi. It didn't arrive because the Tet Offensive had held it up in Saigon. The Viet Cong had taken over the airport, Tan Sanut Airport in Saigon. But finally, yeah, we, the plane arrived after an interesting week in Vientiane with Dan Berg and I got to be real friends, got to real know one another. And, and then we flew to Hanoi, we picked up the three prisoners and brought them back to Vientiane. And, and anyway, yeah, after that, Dan Bergen became very involved in the anti-war movement and, you know, the Catonsville Nine and, and all sorts of actions of civil disobedience. And, and uh, you know, I became, continued to be involved in the movement. Together with Noam Chomsky, who we speak with in our podcast episode 12 about the geopolitics of the Vietnam War, Howard also played a role in an important episode in resistance to the war, the release of the Pentagon Papers by Daniel Ellsberg an analyst at the U.S. military-linked RAND Corporation. Well, I'd like to exaggerate my role, of course, <laughs> uh, but I'll try to tell the truth. <laughs> I, I, I got to know Dan Ellsberg uh, when he left the RAND Corporation, uh, left the government, and had a kind of some sort of fellowship at MIT. And uh, this was, I suppose this was around 19... 70, 69, 70. And uh, so I met him at one of these anti-war rallies and, and we, we hit it off. We became friends and uh, he and his wife, Pat, and uh, I and my wife, we came again going out together. And, and one time uh, we were visiting uh, him. He and Pat had an apartment in Cambridge um, Near Harvard Square. I don't know if you know this area, but um, the, um, we visited them in their apartment, and, and Dan said, um, I'd like to show you something. <laughs> 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 yeah, he, had a, 
he had a sense of the drama. You know, he, he, Dan Ellsberg is a very dramatic guy. I mean, actually, he does dramatic things which hardly require over-dramatizing, but that's not going to stop him. He will dramatize the already dramatic, you know. <laughs> anyway, so he told me, he said, oh, you know, I and my friend Anthony Rousseau, who also worked for the Rand Corporation, they had ordered this uh, secret history to be put together of the Vietnam War, which to do it for the Defense Department. I had worked on it, and Tony Russo, and we decided we would photocopy 7,000 pages and make it public. And, uh, and he brought out a bunch of <laughs> this paper. He said, would you like to have some? <laughs> it's like, you know, like, would you have to, like to have a drink or something like that? A polite thing to do. I said, yeah. So anyway, I, I, I uh, took charge of some of these papers and, and uh, shortly after that, I guess it was, you know, early 71 uh, that Dan Ellsberg and, and his wife Pat and Roz and I were going out to a movie together. Uh, we were going uh, to see Bush Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, <laughs> which I think Dan Ellsberg had seen six times. <laughs> and uh, and when they came over to pick us up, we had a little apartment in Newton. And uh, when they came to pick us up, Dan Ellsberg was very obviously agitated. And said, What's the matter? And well, he says, you know, I gave copies of the Pentagon Papers to all these newspapers, the Times and the Post. And, so on, and none of them have done anything with it. But tomorrow morning, the Times is going to print a bunch of the paper. So I said, why are you upset? He said, because they didn't tell me. <laughs> and this was Saturday night. Sunday, that Sunday, the next day, the Times, big headline. And that, of course, then there's the government began looking frantically for the person who had released these papers and for a while it wasn't known. Then somebody exposed the fact that it was Dan Ellsberg and then began looking for him and he went underground. And, uh, and in the meantime, while he was underground, some of us were distributing his papers to other newspapers and I played a part in distributing uh, the copy of the papers to the Boston Globe, which then printed it and and, and and then he, uh, at a certain point, he decided to surrender to the FBI in his little, uh, you might say, a little party <laughs> in front of the federal building in Boston where he, he and Pat showed up and the FBI was there and they were a little embarrassed because they hadn't known where he was and, you know, and so he was arrested and, and he was put on trial and, in Los Angeles. And, and I was asked to be a witness in the trial because one of the things that had to be done in the trial was to explain to the jury what was in the Pentagon Papers. Because the jury uh, was being told by the government to release these documents of danger to the security of the United States. I mean, that's the basis for the indictments. And he was indicted on 13 different counts for 10 years each, 130 years in jail. <laughs> and uh, his friend Tony Russo had helped him. He was also indicted. And so they had his trial out in L.A. in 73. And, and I, I went out to L.A. to testify in the trial. My job was to tell the jury what was in the Pentagon paper. So I actually had an opportunity to like to give a four-hour lecture to the jury on the history of the Vietnam War and to explain to them how this releasing this was not uh, dangerous to the national security. It was just embarrassing to the U.S. government, and that's why they didn't want it released. And I told them what was in, because they, the jury did not have the papers in front of them. The papers had to be introduced as exhibits, you see. So I had a job of telling him, you know, this is what's in the papers. 
This tells you that the United States created the government of South Vietnam, which we claim we oh, were coming in to help them. No, we, we brought Mr. Ziem, the head of the South Vietnamese government, from New Jersey to Vietnam, set him up, gave him something to drink. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, so the trial took place and interesting trial the government put on witnesses to say yeah this is a danger and so on and uh, but then in the midst of the trial the uh, the scandal broke around the Nixon administration and the Watergate scandal and then it turned out that Nixon had ordered a sec <laughs> his team uh, of uh, official thugs to break into the psychiatrist's office, this Dan Ellsberg psychiatrist, and because and Nixon wanted to to get something uh, to show he was a nut, right? And if somebody has visited a psychiatrist, he must be a nut, not like Nixon. So uh, the break-in, the news of the break-in, and the judge in the trial said, "No, we can't let the trial go on. It's it's tainted by what the government did." So. That was the end of the trial, and uh, uh, so that Dan Ellsberg since then has been very, very active in movement against nuclear weapons and been arrested many times. Participating in these movements inspired Howard to start thinking about how to record and write about that sort of history of mass social movements from below. I was really influenced by my experience, my experience in the South especially and in my experience in the anti-war movement, both experiences uh, having persuaded me that uh, the histories of, the, of our country were inadequate, that they left out the, the people who, were, who made history, the working people, the black people, Native Americans, women. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, for instance, talking about the influence of my experience in the South and getting me to write the book. I, when I was in Selma, Alabama, I, I contacted Columbia University, which, where I had my PhD. I knew they had an oral history project. I also knew what the oral history project was. It wasn't a Studs Terkel project. It was a project where they interviewed famous people ex-secretaries of state, ex-generals, etc., and recorded uh, their interviews. But I wrote to them, I said, you know, it's a, you're an oral history project. There's real history going on down here. <laughs> really interesting people to talk to, not ex-generals, not ex-secretaries of state, just people involved in a very important and dramatic movement. So... All they have to do is send somebody down here with a tape recorder. And, uh, I got a letter back from Columbia University. Well, uh, very good idea. <laughs> when somebody starts off with, that's a very good idea, you know they're not going to do anything. <laughs> it's a very good idea. But we don't have the resources to do that. Columbia University doesn't have the resources. You know, it's, well, it's like the United States government it doesn't have the resources to build another school. <laughs> you know, they don't have the resources. So anyway, I I, uh, I started taping. I was taping interviews with people in the movement, taping the evening in, in Selma, Alabama, well, and uh, and and yeah, and I think that helped. Uh, so sort of germinate the idea in, in me of uh, history from below. This work eventually culminated in the writing and publication of the first edition of A People's History of the United States by Beacon Press in 1980. Now, some people criticised the book for failing to devote enough attention to struggles of particular groups like Native Americans and black people. Howard basically acknowledged this, but said it was beyond the scope of his book to devote the deserved attention to different groups, so he encouraged the writing and publication of other, more specific histories. So now, Beacon has a whole range of additional related titles, including An Indigenous People's History of the United States by Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz, 
A Queer History of the United States by Michael Bronsky. A Black Women's History of the United States by Dana Rami Berry and Callie Nicole Gross. An Afro-Indigenous History of the United States by Carl T. Mays. And An African-American and Latinx History of the United States by Paul Ortiz. The concept of history from below has a lot of its roots in Marxism, particularly Marx's ideas that, quote, the history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles. And the idea that people, quote, make their own history, but they do not make it just as they please. They do not make it under circumstances chosen by themselves, but under circumstances directly encountered, given and transmitted from the past. When I was, I suppose, 17, 18, and and maybe it was my communist friends in the neighborhood uh, who were always giving out literature (laughs) and who gave me a copy of the Communist Manifesto, when I read the Communist Manifesto, I thought, wow, <laughs> uh, that explains a lot. Uh, that, yeah, after all, the Communist Manifesto is, you know, it's not a scholarly, complex thing. It's very relatively simple and clear, you know. Here, it shows you the historical development of, of the human race um, from primitive communism through feudalism and capitalism and uh, and, and t- analyzes capitalism and shows you why capitalism fails and what's wrong with it and and how it's it's a historical phenomenon it's not a permanent fixture in in our history it came into being at a certain point and will leave at a certain point and be replaced by a different society, a social society. Anyway, it all made sense to me. You might say it made sense of my own life. And so I, I, when I got together with my other three radical shipyard workers, we met once a week and read books. We read Marx and Engels. Uh, we read all sorts of things and discussed them. So... Yeah, and later on I read volume one of Capital. Even tried to read volume two <laughs> and volume three. Ooh. <laughs> that, maybe that led me to the conclusion that better not to write long and complex and difficult things, write things that people can understand. And so in my play, for instance, uh, I don't know if you know my play, but... But, you know, there's a sort of exchange between Marx and his wife. This is Howard's play, Marx in Soho. She sort of shakes her head about Das Kapital. No, no, this is, look, she reads the first sentence of Das Kapital, which is uh, so forbidding, you know. Uh, history of all societies, history of commodities and this and that. And she said, no, that won't do you have to write like the Communist Manifesto. Anyway, uh, I, uh, um, no, I was very interested in Marxist theory when I was teaching. I was teaching political theory. I, I taught Marxism. Soon I was teaching a seminar in Marxism and anarchism and comparing their ideas. And, and so, yes, I, um, I guess, yeah, that, that interest in Marxism led me to to write this play. Howard also wrote a play about famous Lithuanian-born Jewish anarchist Emma Goldman, reflecting his interest in anarchism as well as Marxism. I don't think I've ever specifically identified myself as an anarchist. Maybe I don't specifically identify myself as anything because I'm cautious about labeling myself and when people don't know what the label means, you know, and because the word anarchist suggests so many different things, so I don't want people to get the wrong impression. I don't want them to think I'm a bomb thrower. I'm a peaceful person. <laughs> and uh, we, but probably a, of all the political philosophies that there are, probably anarchism comes closest to my way of thinking. And I think when I try to think of when did I become interested in it, um, maybe even before, well, even before I began 
and specifically reading anarchist ideas. Even before I read Emma Goldman's autobiography, I was already, well, for one thing, I was disaffected from the Soviet Union, from that idea of socialism, and, uh, and therefore I was open to the idea that uh, all governments uh, are dangerous to human freedom and that we need a society that's free of authority. Um, but my specific introduction to anarchism came in the 60s um, when actually I encountered a fellow historian named Richard Drennan who had written a biography of Emma Goldman. I didn't know that, but you know, when two academics get together, they say, oh, what have you written? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just wrote this biography of Emma Goldman. No. Um, I actually had read a little about Emma Goldman. You know, vaguely, I knew uh, anarchist, you know. But I decided I would read his book, uh, Rebel in Paradise. It's a wonderful book. And it excited me, by Emma Goldman. Then I read on, went on to read her autobiography, Living My Life, which is one of the great autobiographies. Um, which later I would always recommend to my students, and uh, and so I yeah. And then I you know read Bakunin and Kropotkin, and um, so I yeah I was um, more and more uh, attracted to anarchism because it was anti-authoritarian. Here, Howard's referring to pioneering Russian anarchists Mikhail Bakunin and Pyotr Kropotkin. Talking about labeling yourself and and or describing what you believe in and, and as I say, I've always had trouble saying, "Oh, I'm a socialist," or "I'm a Marxist," or "I'm this," or "that." Well, I will say, "Oh, I believe in socialism," so long as I can explain what I mean. <laughs> I, I'm a Marxist, so long as I can explain what I mean. And uh, but uh, sometimes I will say, "Well." Um, there's a three-word description of how I feel. <laughs> I got this from Donald Trump, the Hollywood writer who was blacklisted and wrote one of my favorite books, Johnny Got His Gun, a great anti-war novel. And Dalton Trumbo was once asked, well, are you a communist? Or what do you believe in? You know, what, How do you describe yourself? So well, what I believe in, he says, is Socialism without jails. Three word. <laughs> I thought, yeah, that's good. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so I, I, I wrote a play about Emma Goldman. And, and the play was the longest running play in Boston in 1977. It was interesting to me is that, I mean, anarchism is presumably a political philosophy held by very few people. You know, and anarchists are on the fringes of society. But if you present anarchist ideas, at, or present them through a fascinating character like Emma Gordon, people are all for it. They're interested. Now, lots of people, and especially lots of Marxists and anarchists, think of their two philosophies as being diametrically opposed. But for Howard and WCH, they can be complementary. Yeah, if you take the analysis of Marxism, of capitalism, and and his call to action, his call for philosophers to change the world, and and not simply re record it, and and take the anarchist idea of being suspicious of authority and centralized power, and and uh, yeah, I think that I think that blending of Marxist and anarchist ideas is something that. Is a good idea. To give a historical example of this, the Paris Commune uprising of 1871 had participants who were socialists and anarchists, and the bodies which were established by the working class during the rebellion to govern society were the inspiration for how a free society could be run both for Marxists and anarchists. Well, the Paris Commune was a situation in which, um, I guess, taking advantage of the fact that France and Germany were 
at war, and, and it was an opportunity for workers to seize the city of Paris and to take charge of the city and to set up a commune. Uh, they were called the communards, and, and they created a, a cooperative egalitarian society in Paris where people traded things and people, uh, and where uh, there's no crime really. People had nothing to be <laughs> to be criminal about. <laughs> no, there was, and where decisions were made by clusters of people gathering in the streets and and then passing on their ideas to the, the members of the sort of the leaders of the commune. But the leaders of the commune were people who didn't get a salary which was greater than an ordinary worker's salary, and uh, they. They created schools for women. There was no such thing as education for women at that time. And they uh, had free admission to the theater. They, um, yeah, they made things available to to everybody on an egalitarian basis, and they made decisions based on people getting together and talking and discussing and. And it was, it was an admirable society while it lasted, and then it was crushed. But there have been other instances like that in history, which are models in the sense that, well, they give us at least a glimpse of what is possible. You know, Barcelona in 1936, early months of the Spanish Civil War, as described by George Orwell in his book, Homage to Catalonia. Again, people sharing things, uh, no crime. Uh, and uh, what's interesting is in the Grapes of Wrath, which we were talking about before at the very end, Tom Joad, who certainly doesn't know anything about political theory, never read anything about any of these things, but he talks about how in the government camps that were set up to help migrant workers, that people helped one another. And he said, there are no cops keeping order. No. And, and we had a better order than any cop could bring us, you know. And so I, th I think it's something that people, the kind of society that people would welcome. Listeners can learn more about the Spanish Civil War and those revolutionary early months in our podcast episodes 39 to 40. Despite being influenced by these revolutionary ideas, Howard saw revolution as more of a gradual process than a rapid overhaul of society. I don't think revolution in the old sense of seizing power of the capital. No, we've had enough experience with that to suggest that that's dangerous and corrupting. And yes, I think building institutions, it's a slower process. Building free institutions within the old society and so liberating our, the ground one by one, you know, uh, liberating this institution and that institution and you know, workers taking over industries, students taking over, and universities, uh, people in neighborhoods taking over the running of the, uh, the neighborhoods and 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 the security of the neighborhood. I think, yeah, I think it will come, not gradualism in the sense of, you know, <laughs> waiting too long, uh, but uh, but yes, uh, uh, working to liberate society piece by piece from within. Recently, there's been a tendency for some on the left, particularly those in the US who want to push the Democrats in a more social democratic direction, to criticise Howard Zinn and his school of history from below. For example, it's been claimed that Howard was generally pessimistic about the ability of movements to win, and that his view of history is just one of constant defeat. But this couldn't be further from the truth. To name just a few examples, in Chapter 9 of A People's History of the United States, he talks in great detail about the role played by grassroots rebellions of enslaved people and the abolitionist movement in the overthrowing of slavery in the US. In chapter 13, he recounts strikes like the women textile workers in Lawrence, Massachusetts, which won pay increases. And in chapter 17, he talks about how militant black freedom struggles in the 1950s and 60s led to the granting of civil rights. What his critics seem more annoyed by is not that his worldview is actually pessimistic, but that his work both focuses on grassroots struggles as being the driving force behind these changes, as opposed to enlightened or progressive politicians, 
and that his vision of change is ultimately more radical than their own. So where Howard does look at politicians or other powerful people, rather than see them as pushing forward progressive change out of the goodness of their hearts, he primarily sees progressive change as concessions they were pressured into from below, and which were often compromises against more radical change, based on the balance of power between social movements and the ruling class. Sometimes the nature of these concessions as compromises against radical change was admitted explicitly. For example, in chapter 13, he cites the progressive Milwaukee Journal newspaper criticising conservatives who they claimed, quote, fought socialism blindly, while the progressives fight it intelligently and seek to remedy the abuses and conditions upon which it thrives, end quote. Now, it does make sense for the social democratic left, who emphasise electing progressive leaders and politicians, to be unhappy with Howard's approach and to disagree with it. But painting it as pessimistic is just incorrect, as Howard gives multiple examples of the ability of movements to win. And in any case, history books have long been full of accounts of great men, politicians like Franklin Roosevelt and Abraham Lincoln, talking about how noble they were and all they supposedly achieved. But Howard's people's history is openly and honestly a very deliberate attempt to tip the scales away from this approach towards looking at mass social movements and the roles of millions of ordinary people in reshaping society for themselves. From all his experience in social movements and his studies of them, Howard thinks there are important lessons we can learn about how we can make social change happen. There are certain uh, tactics which are the most effective in confronting power. Uh, based on the idea that the people in power hold their power only because they are obeyed. When people withdraw their obedience, when people withdraw their, their support uh, from the institutions, people who control these institutions become powerless. Notice when a strike is a fundamental weapon because no matter how powerful the corporation, if workers go on strike, the corporation is helpless. This is what happened in the 1930s. People thought, oh, you can't fight General Motors or Ford. Look at, they're rich, they're big. And, no. The workers leave the factory and they can't function. They are helpless. When, same thing with consumers. When consumers boycott, uh, this is a not sufficiently used weapon. It was used by Chavez on the West Coast and the farm workers, the boycott of grapes, and it brought farm growers, these very wealthy, powerful farm growers, to have to recognize the farm workers' union. Uh, when Jesse Jackson threatened to call a boycott of Texaco because they had been guilty of racist practices, Texaco immediately caved in. They were worried, you know, in other words, this is, this is what they depend on. They depend on people to buy their products. You stop buying their products, they are scared. And then, of course, when soldiers refused to fight, which is what happened in the Vietnam War, they couldn't count on the military anymore. Uh, you know, that's an aspect of the anti-war movement that has been uh, underplayed. But uh, the fact is that the GI resistance in the Vietnam War was crucial in making the U.S. government decide it could not carry on the war. The GI resistance to the Vietnam War is an extremely inspiring and important movement, which really isn't spoken about enough. You can learn more about it in our podcast episodes 10 and 11 in conversation with anti-war veterans, as well as our episodes 21 to 24 in conversation with an anti-war sailor who organised a mutiny. Uh, so... What I'm saying is we have to think about tactics that uh, can overcome power. Uh, have to think about what it is that holds these people in power, these institutions in power. And, uh, and so developing these the strike, the boycott, the, the refusal of soldiers in the military, and the building of cooperative institutions, yes, the building of cooperatives, all kinds of cooperatives, farmers' cooperatives, consumers' cooperatives, housing cooperatives, uh, I mean, all, all of that, you know. And yeah, it's a long process, but I, I think, um, you know, I think it can be done. <laughs>
Oh bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, 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 partigiano portami via che mi sento di morire e se muoio you can read about lots of examples of these type of tactics in Zin's work, including A People's History of the United States and all the books in Beacon Press's People's History of the US series. Links to get these from independent bookstores in the show notes. This is also something we hope to do through our work, so we post stories like this on our social media accounts every day, on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, Mastodon, TikTok and so on. And soon we'll be launching an interactive website with timelines and maps of all of our stories, so look out for that. That brings us to the end of this double podcast episode about the life and work of Howard Zinn. This podcast is part of a number of events for Howard Zinn's centenary. Links to more of them in the show notes. If you enjoyed this interview, you can also watch the full thing on video on the DVD available from PM Press, link in the show notes. As a listener to the podcast, you can get 10% off the cost that or anything else in our store using the discount code WCHPODCAST. As always, we've got sources, links to more info, transcripts, and more on the webpage for this episode. Link in the show notes. One last time, this podcast is only made possible because of support from you, our listeners, on Patreon. So if you can, please consider joining us for as little as $2 a month at patreon.com slash workingclasshistory. Link in the show notes. Supporters get great benefits like early access to episodes, as well as exclusive bonus episodes, free and discounted books, merch, and more. If you can't spare the cash, no worries. Please just tell your friends about the podcast, share links to episodes on your social media, and take a second to give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Thanks again to our Patreon supporters for making this podcast possible. Special thanks to Stone Lawson. Our theme tune is Bella Ciao. Thanks for permission to use it from Disky del Sole. You can buy it or stream it on the links in the show notes. This episode was edited by Jesse French. Thanks to all of you for listening. Catch you next time. Libertad